Dude, I'm so excited. We're giving out shirts this month. I feel like you said that before. Everybody loves fucking shirts, dude. He's a repeat. Yeah, I, uh, oh. we're giving away. So, you know what's funny? We do all these giveaways and promos. The most popular ones, always by far. Shirts, bro. Always. Oh, Everybody wants Who a cool shirt. Who doesn't want to rock an awesome shirt and, yeah. and an awesome podcast? But we're not just going to give away or hook you up with one shirt. You're going to get two for almost free. Yeah, almost free. Almost, almost free, free means under a dollar. A under cents, a dollar. You know? Under a dollar. So here's what you do. You enroll in the MAPS RGB bundle, which is MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of exercise programming. Or you take it to the next level and do the Super Bundle, which includes MAPS Prime, MAPS Anywhere, and all of it is dis- discounted over 30%. Get one of those two, and it's your pick. You can pick two shirts for under a dollar. It's pretty awesome. Pretty awesome little little discount deal there going on. You find it at mindpumpmedia.com. If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. An official badass joining the team and uh, hosting the kettlebell. Yeah, she's actually been putting it together with uh, with Mike Salemi. That's right. Uh, the badass. Both the powerhouses of the whole kettlebell sport. She's right. a, in one place. She's a badass. So we're interviewing Brittany. Um, her Instagram page is what's her Instagram page? Just KB, KB Fit KB, Brit. Yeah, KB Fit Brit. KB Fit Brit. She's like one of the top female competitors in kettlebell sport. I know I'm going to butcher her last name. I'm going to try anyway. Her full name is Brittany Van Shrevendick. Did I say that right? Uh, Who knows? God, God bless you for trying. But I call her Brit. Yeah. Uh, and we had a nice conversation with her about the sport, about her own uh, you know, fitness past and whatnot. Um, you can come see her at the competition. She'll be hosting it with Mike. So without any further ado, here's Mind Pump talking to Brittany Van Shrevendick. Uh, Adam, I forgot to tell you, this weekend I ran into another dude with a uh, the same kind of what is that again that we call it? Porn stash? The kind that you have? Mm, yeah. <laughs> and um, it, you know, his was, uh, it was good, but I think yours was better. And he's had his for a while. So whatever really? you're doing is working. Well, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of hell on wheels. I've been watching that show. I'm on season five now. So I've yeah. got, yeah, plenty. You've been of- putting the beard oil in there? I, I have. I've been uh, just a little bit, though. It doesn't take I very see. much to, for the, the little what, bit. What makes one mustache better than the other? Is it just simply size or uh, like shininess? That's a very, or, you know or what? That's know. a very good question. Let, yeah, me tell you how this, let me tell you how this works. <laughs> so, um, this is the important stuff. I mean, I think any any female, would, if size does matter. So anyone says size doesn't matter, it does matter. <laughs> but really, um, a lot of men have and a texture. hard... Texture. A lot of men have a hard time like connecting parts of beards and stashes. I can't do that part. So, it doesn't grow there. You know, this is like one of the hardest like stashes to grow like and so you have to be like the manliest of men yeah, to you grow like this patch of great ah, hair that see. won't grow so it's not to but say you know, like it, Sal's not manly because he can't grow it it's just he's less of a man I see you know than, yeah. see. I just, I just think testosterone it's hasn't... so funny how, how obsessed guys are with their facial hair whoa, whoa, whoa. it's great wait it's a great. second it's no different than you girls in the <laughs> highlighting and the curling oh, yeah, and the primping right. right it's I mean really that's yeah. mm. it's just our excuse to do that kind of shit yeah if you don't have as much hair on your head then you need to yeah I'm not doing so well we are pre Madonna. <laughs> Let's be honest. But I can't. Yeah, I can't connect. I end up if I try and get that. I end up getting the Fu Manchu, like the, like the the Chinese Kung Fu master thing. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Where you get the long. That'd like, be awesome oh. if you did that. Yeah. yeah. So, but Adam, you said it's hard to grow. It makes me think like you sit there and concentrate on making it grow. Is there a technique? <laughs> well, it's like, a, like a chia pet, like formula. You, you have like lucky, somewhere? genetically blessed, or oh, I wouldn't say that. It took me 30, 30 plus years to get there. It's mm. a, yeah, it just takes time. It takes time secret? and time and grit, consistency. Focus, mm. a lot of discipline. <laughs> you know, Reps. you got to be good with the razor too. Got it. Because because yeah. sometimes you know I'm not gonna lie. There's some areas where I'm not like all the way full, but you know how I cut it, it makes it look like you're it's training full. it. Yeah, I'm tra- mm. exactly. Are you getting less? Like a hedge. Are you getting less kisses? No, I think my girl likes it. I told you mm. we do. We do a lot of uh, role playing with the whole uh, <laughs> railroad thing. Yeah. The rail- the rail- yeah. Do you have the hat that's got the stripes? Yeah, do we have the whole ensemble, man? She's, Did you uh, say railroad? Yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. That's what hell on wheels. Conductor, is, conductor. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, let's be real. If she didn't like it, it probably wouldn't be there anymore. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. If, it, it, if it impeded on my uh, bedroom time, I most <laughs> certainly shaved my face I would too have many a baby times. Face. <laughs> I like uh. to. You know, we're six years deep into our relationship. I got to keep her guessing. You know what I'm saying? So 
That's one of my strategies. Excellent. Yeah. I see. <laughs> Enough about me. Yeah. Talk about the, the yeah, badass so, chick that's in the room with us, so, man. So uh, you are, from other people, other people have said that you're one of the more well-known kettlebell sport female athletes um, that competes uh, at a very high level. And you just had a competition, right? Yes. Where was it? What, what you're was it? also the first female ever to come in here that's actually strong, stronger than Sal. So this mm. is uh, also oh, yeah? impressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. That yeah. makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah. If that's true, you're twice <laughs> as strong as Adam. <laughs> <laughs> I love showing up the guys. I, uh, you know what? Let's not joke because let's all not joke around here because the truth is with those kettlebells, she could to kill us all. Well, hey, I, let's, 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 start, the truth, start, let's start right there because you bring that up. I'm curious, um, you know, someone who competes at your level, uh, I can't imagine the the discipline, the work ethic, the time you've put under the kettlebell or whatever you would say. Um, what what drove you uh, to be competitive like that? You just said, I like to show up to boys. Like, where does that come from? Where does that stem from? I'm just, I'm just really competitive. I think it's probably just growing up. I have three siblings and I feel like my dad was just always kind of encouraging us to be competitive, you, you whether older, it was younger. intentional or not. Um, I'm I have a, a little sister, an older sister, older brother. Oh, okay. Yeah, middle child. Yeah, middle child. Marsha, Marsha. So <laughs> what? 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 How did you get into kettlebells? Because that's not nearly as common as other forms of exercise. How did you get introduced to them? Were you an athlete before? I used to do track and field in high school, so okay. I, I was an athlete in, in high school and wanted to do that going into college, but it didn't really end up panning out. So I actually got an internship at a gym during college and found kettlebells through there. It was at um, the Ice Chamber that's up in Richmond, mm. East Bay, and they're super into kettlebell sport. They're one of the biggest gyms in the U.S. for it. And I had no idea. I walked in and I was like, yeah, I know you guys are kind of into kettleballs, which, <laughs> you know, if you know kettlebells, Sacrilege yeah, thing, right? yeah, you can't say kettleball. It's like a party foul. So <laughs> I, I didn't, I, I was worried that, like I wouldn't get the internship because I had said kettleball because I <laughs> was being interviewed and, and the woman, Sarah, who interviewed me, she was like, it's actually kettlebell. <laughs> like she corrected me right there. And I was like, oh my God, I can't <laughs> believe I just said that. But um, luckily they still hired me and I ended up, um, you know, learning just so much about kettlebells in the sport and um, having some great role models there who were um, really into competing in the sport. And so wanting to do that as well. Did, were you good? Like right? Because obviously to compete at a high level, that means A, you train your butt off, but B, you probably were kind of a natural to it. Was that, was that? Mm, did, actually not really. My, wow. I, I, I guess I never really thought about it until there was this time my, my coach from Ice Chamber, he wrote an article about me and he, he said in the article, Brittany was by no means a natural when she started <laughs> kettlebell lifting. I was like, she ouch. <laughs> I was like, wow, I didn't know that. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> but uh, it was super challenging at first, but I'm definitely one of those people that likes to rise to the challenge. So I think the fact that it didn't come easy was something that made me want to learn it even more. Mm. Could you, for the listeners, explain... Uh, one of the basics of the sport, the competition, what does it look like? What do you have to do in order to compete uh, with other people? So typically it's a a 10 minute set of kettlebell of a kettlebell event. It could be um, the clean and jerk long cycle or snatch or just the jerk. Now you say 10 minutes. What does that mean? Does that mean you're doing it? It means 10 10 minutes? minutes, no setting the kettlebells down. If you have one kettlebell, you can switch one time. But once you switch, you can't switch back. So it's it's usually you know five minutes per arm or just ten minutes without setting the bells down, which is really brutal. If you've ever used kettlebells at all, you could kind of imagine you know doing hanging onto that thing for ten minutes. That's yeah, insane. Just, just holding onto a kettlebell for ten minutes is a pain in the ass. Exactly. I, would, I, would, I used to make my members when we give them a tour, like if someone came oh, in and they're like you overweight, did. you know, and I'd, I'd give them like a like a thirty pound kettle or for thirty pound dumbbell, and I would just make them carry it around as we toured, and then have them put it down afterwards and ask him how it felt to lose the 30 pounds, you know? And so and that was a pain in the ass just to walk around the gym for fucking two minutes. I can't imagine 10 minute cycle. Oh, I, I challenge the listeners right now, grab a couple 20 pound dumbbells and just hold them for 10 minutes and walk around and see how tired your hands get and the rest of your body. So this is literally 10 minutes. Don't put them down. And then they count every completed rep. And so however many reps you do within that period of time, that's your score. Yes. Wow. So in order to do that, you have to really pace yourself, obviously have endurance, good technique. 
Uh, I would say good good technique being the most crucial part of it. So explain some of the techniques that you guys use to be able to go through. Is it just learning how to pace yourself? or A lot of it is learning how to relax at the right parts of the lift. So if you're not uh, relaxing in, in the rack position when, when you're holding the bells kind of up in front of the chest, um, if you're, you, know, you don't have great flexibility in that position, you can't rest your, your elbows on your hips, it makes it a lot harder because you'd be you know, using your arms to hold the bells there. So um, that's a lot of times why you see some of the, the women who are lifting heavier do better than the guys that are lifting heavier if those guys don't have good flexibility mm. because they're just not able to rest at the right positions and conserve the energy for the right parts of the lift. Mm. This you- reminds me of what Mike was so – why he said he liked it because it's kind of this combination of like – technique endurance flexibility strength it really encompasses everything right you can't get away with not being good at one of those to be if you're going to be at the top level right exactly it's got this kind of strange juxtaposition of where your some parts of your body are relaxing but some parts of your body are working at the same time which is very challenging for kind of that brain body connection now uh were you before you got introduced to kettlebells you were pretty active and you worked out quite a bit and yes. then you started training a lot with kettlebells and in particular training for the sport or kettlebell sport. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners that don't know what the sport looks like, but uh, even more so don't know how the body changes when you start training that way. What were some of the things that you noticed in your body? Uh, what are some, like, can you pick out a, a kettlebell sport athlete by looking at them like you can, uh, you know, a shot putter or a sprinter or a long distance runner? Are there Sometimes. certain characteristics? I think it also depends on how long they've been in the sport. So there's, like any sport, there's some um, some things that will happen that could be not so beneficial, beneficial. Like some of the top lifters have a little bit of like a forward head posture mm. from kind of like pushing their head through the bells or um, a little bit of um, rounded, rounded shoulders. Some people uh, like me will have kind of what I call like cat elbows, like my, my elbows kind of bend backwards a little bit, which I think they already had that position before, but sometimes just the, the weight of the bells can end up pushing them back a little mm-hmm. bit. But definitely um, really strong like quads, um, probably some, some nice boulder shoulders going on. <laughs> So um, there's there's definitely some good musculature that that is built in there as well. Do so now s- they they allow um, belts and they allow squat shoes and uh, so this is does anybody try it without any sort of uh, supported uh, uh, positioning or, or like uh, apparatuses? Yeah, I think uh, not everybody uses a belt. Again, it goes back to like the flexibility that people have because a belt is in kettlebell sport is really not really used for lower back support. It's mostly for giving you a better connection of your elbows to your hips so that when you launch the kettlebells on a jerk, Mm. you um, are more efficient. So if you have great flexibility, you might not, you can get away with not using a belt. Or if you're not lifting super heavy, you might not need a belt. Um, As far as the shoes, there's some people that think that maybe you don't need such a hard shoe for you know, many repetitions over time. And, and typically the shoes are, are used more if you have a lack of like ankle mobility mm-hmm. um, and range of motion. So if you don't have that, you, you probably don't necessarily need a lifting shoe. Yeah, because it seems like, I mean, just the swing, it's so technical. There's so many different cues and things that you have to learn. You have to have really good body awareness to even pull a lot of these movements off. You would think that, you know, you'd be hyper connected, you know, going through this already. So, yeah. Do yeah, you, it's tough to learn for sure. Yeah. Is, is it a male-dominated sport, or are there a lot of women competing? I think uh, in the U.S., there's, I think there's more women. I feel like especially, really, oh wow, kind of getting into the higher levels. Um, for a long time, the women were just doing single bell lifts as well, which is a little bit easier to get into with the heavier weights for the guys. It's like if you want to do. You know, for for anybody really, if you want to do two kettlebells and get up to a higher weight, it's not just something you can do as, um, you know, just a little hobby and spend one or two days a week. It's like you really have to work super hard at it. So I think um, that made it a little bit harder for guys to to get into it. Plus, it's a little bit hard on the ego sometimes because if as a guy you come in and you get crushed by using two twelve kilo bells trying to go for ten minutes, that probably doesn't feel very good if you come from a background of lifting super heavy and you're kind of 
feel like you should come into this and be able to lift heavy too. It's actually more of an endurance sport really than it is Mm. strength. But I think that sometimes gets confused. And for some guys, it's maybe hard on their ego. Mm. I had no idea. (laughs) I had no idea. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah, I had no idea so many women uh, like to compete in it. I would imagine that it would be a male-dominant sport like most you know, weight type based uh, competition type sports. Why do you think women like it so much? I think part part of that is also the influence. Um, there was a big influence from uh, the ice chamber the Jimmy used to work at. Um, the The women that started there, they're known as like the ice chamber kettlebell girls. Mm. They were some of the first women. Um, it's like the Budweiser get, girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. To Except get to get answer. certain. So. Yeah. Not not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> to get certain rank. They were the first women to get certain rankings and kind of help influence a lot more participation of women all over the world. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I think maybe just having those those certain role models and because it's not quite as intimidating maybe as you know the weight isn't necessarily as heavy as something you would do in a powerlifting competition Mm -hmm. um it's more endurance based which you know i think there's a lot of studies that show women are really good at endurance sports Mm -hmm. what's your background by the way Mm -hmm. with with fitness uh like educational background are you uh you talked about certifications and is this was this your is this your chosen field uh still do you still work or is this what you do full-time this is what I do full time. I actually have a um, civil engineering degree from Cal, mm. which is completely different. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really need a degree for what I do now. But um, yeah, I kind of veered past after I started uh, working at the gym that I was at during college. Mm. And then um, from there, I got like my uh, CSCS and actually just got my first kettlebell certification last October. I had helped teach certifications. I didn't officially have one for myself. So <laughs> that was kind of funny. Yeah. I, it's, I think we were all uh, a little shocked to discover the, the, the cult surrounding, and I don't mean that in a negative sense. I know I, you keep saying that. It well, sounds, what I, it sounds bad when you say cult. Well, when I say, what I, <laughs> what I mean is just that sometimes you find a really enthusiastic club. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you find a, like a new thing that starts to grow, but before something gets really big, there's this like small passionate, uh, group of people that surround it. It happens with every movement. You know, cro- we talk about CrossFit having that at one point. I mean, we were all at some point, connected or knew of CrossFit because CrossFit originated around here in the Bay Area, Santa Cruz. And we were aware of of it before it became really big. But before it became huge, there were like seven clubs or five clubs and they were all super passionate about what they were doing. And we were really pleasantly surprised to find that kettlebell sport has that same passion, but it's even at at this point, it's bigger, right? There's how many clubs right now in the US? Like 12, 15, something like that? I think there's definitely more than 12 or 15, but uh, some of them are very small. You know, it's still kind of spread out. Like, I'll, I'll get a lot of messages from people who are trying to start kettlebell sport, but there's really almost nothing for, you like know, a place for them to go. Nowhere right? around. They'd have to drive five, six hours to get somewhere that actually has a kettlebell sport coach. So there's a lot of clubs where they're small, and there's a lot of kind of isolated people that are training on their own out there. Um, but yeah, it's got this like fervor around it. Like when when the people who are involved in the sport are very very passionate. Well, that being said, oh, that yeah. makes me want to ask a question. How is how's like the, is there any drama and like competitiveness amongst the? There's got to be. There is so much drama. Oh, you got okay, You have come on. no idea. Lay it down. Yeah. This is what this is what I want to know. I, I need to hmm. know before we have all these guys in our facility because I think we have like eight or nine different clubs, which might kind of give yeah, me. We want to know the dirt on everybody. Yeah, give me the give me the four one one on like. Well, I don't want to bash anyone in particular. That's okay. We can, you can do it as <laughs> you PC. can do it in general. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can, yeah. Well, so people far, I've said. done a great job. People have complimented me on my ability to stay neutral. So I have to kind to try to keep riding that line but <laughs> there's there's kind of a lot of conflicts with different organizations that sort of want to be in charge uh, and um, are these organizations that run competitions is that what yes. you're okay, okay yeah different organizations that, that are running comps and um you know there's there's one competition that kind of wants to follow more of um kind of the Russian, the traditional way that kettlebell sport has always been run in in Russia and in Eastern Europe. And, you know, then there's other organizations that kind of want to just, you know, try to start something new or or realize that the 
the sport is kind of different in America because we've got a lot of amateur lifters, whereas in, in Russia there's just kind of a lot of elite lifters and not really a lot of stuff at the amateur level. A lot of their lifters are guys in the military who – compete like it's their job to compete in kettlebell sport and they just spend like all day training and and the you know the the weightlifting culture is pretty crazy in russia so it's it's very different from what people want to do here a lot of people that compete have you know they have nine to five jobs and they do it for fun and they just want to you know they have disposable income and and want to spend it on on this cool hobby they have but um it's very different so i think the approach kind of has to be different in terms of what the market for you know, competitions is, but there's, there's definitely kind of conflicts between where that should be going. Have you, have you trained in Russia? I, I've been to the world championships in, in Siberia in 2013. Ooh, in Siberia. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. God, that's hardcore. Now uh, let's yeah, get, let's stay on the, this topic of these guys having different, uh, different opinions on how to run the competition. Does this, um, I mean, does this create controversy when they go to run a competition that you've got, Hey, I don't. I'm not going to go if you're going to be running by these rules. Or I mean, what? It's kind of more created, like two to three different groups that people that kind of stick to these certain competitions. So um, some people will only compete under this organization. Some people will only compete under that one. And so um, it's it's almost like there's a little bit of a split within the community of of kettlebell people, <laughs> which you know. What, what I've liked so far about, um, you know, the competition that we're planning in May is that it seemed to bring people from kind of both sides in to compete because it's not necessarily um, one or the other. Yeah, specifically geared towards just one side. So, so do you find like these athletes are the best in this organization? These athletes are the best in this other organization. And now we're getting them to compete against each other. Are we finding yeah. some of that? Yeah. I think that that's definitely coming together. That's kind of cool. Bit. It's like yeah. the early UFC. Now, are there any like staple moves or things that one does and not the other, or that? Yeah, what are the differences? Well, yeah, in- if I, like if I was a, just a spectator who had no yeah. no idea what organization was which, are there certain things like oh, that's definitely you know well, the like, Russian technique? Yeah, or, oh, that's exactly. definitely like, like hard style. Did did CrossFit come up with that swing that goes up really high? Like, what is that? Can you explain <laughs> the that to me? American swing. I- yeah. I, I don't I think CrossFit came up with that. I'm not totally sure where it comes I thought from. So. I, yeah, I haven't I haven't really done much with that swing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was wondering about it. I was like, is this made up? They and, did it again. And, well, how about that too? What do what do most like uh kettlebell sport people think of like CrossFit? Do they do they think that um you guys are like each other, or they are you really like most people mm-hmm. that do kettlebell mm-hmm. sport are not a fan of CrossFit. I can read your smirk right now. You're, <laughs> you're forming a politically correct answer. <laughs> yes. Don't be. That's I why it's wrong. Say, it's all I, right. think, I think most people in kettlebell sport don't like CrossFit. <laughs> there mm-hmm. are a few crossovers. There's actually um, one of the women who will be competing in May, Tara. She's at OKC. I don't know if Mike has talked mm-hmm. about her, but she's uh, pretty new, but awesome, awesome lifter. She's actually a CrossFitter. And a kettlebell athlete, awesome. so she's got oh, wow. cross crossover there. So she's really we'll pray pretty her. good at both. <laughs> yeah, pray for her. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to the different organizations. What are the main differences between them? Uh, you know, for the layman. Well, there's the thing is that there, there's like a lot of organizations, but I would say kind of the main ones that I, I'm kind of referring to right now would be like the the American Kettlebell Alliance, aka, mm. which kind of follows the the standards of the IUKL, which is a international um, organization that out of based in Russia. And so they're more focused on like at their worlds, it's countries. So there would be a team USA that goes over mm. and competes against athletes from different countries. And then there's um, an organization that my coach Dennis Vasiliev and and his coach Sergey Rachinsky formed, which is a World Association of Kettlebell Clubs, and they just did the World Championships that was back in February, which is based around clubs. So it's not necessarily by country, but there might be a bunch of different clubs within the U.S. that come to compete. So it's kind of um, a little bit different that way. Which mm-hmm. is more along the lines of what we're holding here, right? I mean, that's what we have all these different clubs that are coming in uh, that are going to be competing against each other. I like that. It's kind of like. Uh, you know, it reminds me of football or baseball. It's kind of set up more like that. I think that's a more interesting way as a spectator, I think, mm. to watch it. Yeah. What are some other things associated with the culture of kettlebell sport? Um, is there 
like a, a way that you guys like to eat. I mean, I ask this because every, like I said, every, uh, you know. Yeah, like rituals and all these yeah, every, things. Every, yeah, everything I see, like bodybuilders like to eat a certain way and like CrossFit, the paleo. And do you, do, is there, uh, do you guys have your own like, you know, things that you do that are kind of unique to kettlebell sport? I'm, I'm sure there are. Um, I know a lot of people, um, they do this thing called stage five. So it's after a comp, it, it's based on, um, I think it's some training program. I can't remember whose training program it is, but it's based on some training program that has these different stages. And the last stage is stage five, where it's after a competition and you pretty much just eat whatever you want. So people like to, (laughs) you know, on social media after their competition, they're like, stage five. And they post all these like pictures of all this food they're eating. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's sounds like a T-shirt. One. <laughs> it sounds like a you T-shirt. Went, yeah, it you sounds went like totally a, stage five. Yeah, yeah. 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 I like yeah. that. I like that. I wanted to ask you. Uh, you you kind of grazed over uh, talking about being a, a high school athlete and then w- wanting to go play college. Um, talk about what that that transition was like for you, and that that kind of helped shape and develop your character. And what happened during that time that made you do that, and what, what were you going through in your life around there? Yeah, so uh, I had a great uh, high school track and field coach, and he really encouraged me to pursue becoming a heptathlete in college. So I really wanted to. I love track and field, really, really loved it. And um, when I got to Cal, I decided I would try walking onto the team. So that was definitely an experience. Um, I, again, I don't want to, like, badmouth any, anyone in particular, but it just was not a good experience for me. Like, I... Um, I understand you have to prove yourself as like a walk on at a it's a Division one school, but I really had to um, kind of try to force my way in without much support from anybody. The people on the team were not very friendly. The coaches didn't talk to me. Um, I felt like I had a lot of a lot to give in terms of like hard work, and I wasn't necessarily as talented as the other athletes that were there. But I felt like. Um, I was able to really keep up in training and stuff like that. So uh, I, I tried it for a while and decided that, you know, with all the work I was putting in, I would probably, you know, be redshirted for a year or two and, and maybe get to do a couple competitions. So decided it wasn't really worth it. So that kind of, that definitely um, influenced me in that I still really had a drive that I wanted to compete in, in something and, and prove kind of my athletic abilities and which kind of led me to to discover like kettlebell lifting, I think was what helped. So I have a lot, me. I have a lot of buddies that actually went through a similar situation. In fact, some of them actually went to a different college just because they didn't want to have to experience that. They were, you know, Hey, I, I'd rather just go to a D2 or a D3 where I know I'm going to play a lot. Like when you, when you know, knowing what you know now and have gone through it, does part of you wish you would have done that, gone to a smaller school and then went and kicked ass like you probably oh, would. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. I think I really would have enjoyed it. Um, being able to compete in, in college, even, you know, I wouldn't really care what division I was in, you know? Yeah. And and I know when, it, when you're like a really competitive person, and especially with sports like that, uh, that's a tough time Expe- at that age that we're, you know, we're in that, that 15 to 20 years old and going through like that. And that was probably a big dream of yours. Did you feel crushed? Did you, did you go through depression at all? Did it motivate you more to do something else? I mean, how, how did you feel? Or do you remember going through that? I mean, I definitely, it was kind of a up and down experience as I was going through it, for sure. It was, it it was really disappointing, but I was really glad that I actually had tried um, because I feel like if I hadn't tried to walk onto the team and found out what it was like, I probably would have regretted, you know, not seeing whether I could have made it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, I think I, I was fine kind of moving on from it. Um, and, and just deciding to try to find something else. Was there a gap between that and, you know, training with kettlebells? In other words, did you just stop? Did you stop working out? Did you stop being athletic for a second there? No, I, I just kind of was doing stuff on my own. So at first I just started running more. Like I just started running like long distance stuff. And mm. I think I did a half marathon, but kind of decided that was too boring. <laughs> so I, um, I started weightlifting. I just would go to the gym on my own and, and start weightlifting. So kind of really started loving weightlifting, I think, when I was just training on my own during mm-hmm. that time. So I find this challenge quite a bit with uh, athletes that I've worked with who are competitively driven like yourself, where 
they are very, very driven to compete against others or to compete against themselves or a time or, and that's what keeps them motivated to continue working out. Do you find, you know, for yourself that if you don't have that competition that you find it's that you have to find a different motivation to work out? Do you see how that could cause it? Is that, does that cause an issue for you? Are you more holistically oriented now or is it still in that mode? Training for kettlebell sport is definitely the, the biggest motivation for me to work out like I don't do well if I don't have a specific goal Mm. to train and work towards like I I don't think I would be able to do something like bodybuilding which I give props to people that do that at a high level because I feel like it takes so much discipline but to me it doesn't quite motivate me just from like an aesthetic standpoint I feel like I would really need a a specific kind of athletic goal to help me. I kind of, you know, I go through times where I'm like, oh, maybe it'd be fun to just, you know, to take a break from kettlebells, just work out. I can just do whatever I want. Just, you know, no, no rules on it. And then as soon as I kind of start going that direction, I like, I get bored pretty quickly. I like, oh no, I I need to start getting ready for that next challenge and kettlebells, you know? So that's definitely something that keeps me motivated. Do you find it challenging to keep yourself from over training? Oh yeah. Oh, I think I've always had had a hard time with that cuz when I first started um like working at the gym and training kettlebells, I was definitely overtraining and, you know, uh, taking a class and training kettlebells and just too much. So, I think I've gotten better with that in the past few years and realized that, you know, performance is definitely based on being more balanced and taking more rest and recovery and not mm-hmm overtraining because especially with kettlebell sport you have to be so mentally motivated going into a long set that if you're physically tired it just you just you won't be able to do it how do you balance yourself out now i train three times a week so part of that is having a coach that Mm. tells me what to do or what not to do and kind of knowing that like okay my coach would probably tell me this is not a good idea (laughs) so that definitely helps me um so in between days I'll, i'll oftentimes do just you know like yoga or stretching and making sure that i do more recovery that way so three days a week that's it you're at the at this level of training and you only train like for that three days a week is that purely kettlebells or do you incorporate barbells and dumbbells and other forms or modalities I used to do more accessory training with barbells, but I think um, for kettlebell sport, once you hit a certain level of base level of strength, you don't really need a lot of accessory training. For me, I feel like it would be overtraining if I do a lot of additional weight training because there's such a high volume of repetitions with kettlebell sport, which I think people don't always consider. It's so much volume that it's very different from um, doing you know lower rep stuff, even if the weight is a lot heavier, mm-hmm. it takes a, a big toll on your body and your nervous system. So you kind of have to take that into yeah. account. What do you notice uh, gives way, like as far as when you're going through the the competition, what fatigues uh, first? Mm, it depends on the lift. So mm. if if it's um, the snatch lift, everybody will tell you it's like it's your grip. So mm-hmm. if you're, it's, oh, wow. it's all about technique for that lift. So a lot of times, you know, it's so frustrating because if your technique isn't there, you might end your set at a point where you don't really feel that physically tired, but it's just like your forearm is so pumped that you can't hang on to the kettlebell, hmm. which in, in that case, it's, you know, just all about the technical efficiency of it. You know, Mike brought this up too. And are you the same way where he, he made, he's told, he told me like, once he gets like, a minute to three minutes in, he knows what this is going to look like. He can feel his body and what it's going to be like from like, from that exact point. He says, I can tell if my technique is just slightly off and if this is going to be a good, a good round for me or not right within the first minute to three minutes. Is it the same way for you too? Yeah. I I mean, I think, I think I could tell within the first few minutes, whether it's going to be a, you know, an easier set or just a really tough set. Like, not going to set the bells down either way, but you can tell whether it's going to be kind of like a struggle set that day or whether it's going to, yeah. you know, be kind of more of a PR day. <laughs> Any overuse uh, injuries uh, that result? Because it's, it's so, so many reps, so many repetitions of overhead movements. Oh, and yeah. Where do you see all the, all the injuries? Um, usually people get some, at some point during their, their kettlebell lifting career, they're going to get some kind of 
um, forearm pain, whether it's when they're first learning that they're kind of hitting their form with a bell or just some kind of sustained longer injury. Um, a lot of people get some elbow, elbow like tendonitis, mm. um, and, uh, Definitely say shoulder. Shoulder. We're gonna see shoulder. Wow, no low back stuff. Um, lower back probably comes up too, but I I think a lot of times it's it's more like uh, connective tissue and kind of the small like stabilizing muscles. Mm-hmm. A lot of times. Do you see a lot of growth potential for the sport? Do you see? Do you think it could get real big? Oh yeah, I mean, I definitely think it's gonna it's gonna. I don't know if it'll be as big as CrossFit, sure. but I feel like it could definitely be in a similar arena with with. That's mm. what I said. Yeah. What makes you think they can compete with it? Well, like you said, the the passion of the of the people that are in it, um, it has a very supportive community. All the competitions I've I've been to, it's it's people are competitive, but they're super supported, supportive of, of one another. And it's not to say that I've never been in a situation where people were kind of like catty competitive, but most of the time, you know, everybody is supportive of each other's goals while still wanting to do their best as well, which I see as, you know, an environment that anybody who wants to take part will feel, you know, kind of welcomed and, and encouraged to learn and do their best as well. Now, you said it might not be as big as like CrossFit or whatever. What do you see the challenges uh, of it being, uh, of it growing? Uh, now, I, I know as a listener and as someone who's, just been introduced i've just been introduced to this whole world recently and uh, again i commented on the passion and the fervor behind it um and then the other side of me the guy who's the marketing guy uh who you know i'm I'm looking at things objectively i'm like god a 10 minute set that could be boring to watch like is there a a spectator Do, do, do people like to come watch or do you see there that being an issue i have sometimes been surprised by people liking to watch more than i thought they would so just even like my family coming to watch, I I remember they coming to watch my first few competitions. I was like, you don't have to. It's really boring. You're not going to like it. They actually thought it was really cool. Really? And after a few competitions, they would start noticing stuff about different people's technique and mm. like, hey, that person, like that doesn't look good, right? Like that's not good <laughs> technique. You know, they would kind of start noticing stuff. But I definitely think that there might have to be some changes in terms of what exactly the competition would look like. Maybe mm-hmm. it would, you know, be more of a combination of the different exercises with five minute sets or something. I feel like I, I would be open to seeing the sport change a little bit and evolve to increase in popularity. I think like we kind of touched upon some drama that happens. I think that there would be a lot of resistance from people who are, currently leading some leaders of the sport would really, mm. really be against that. They're so, purists, right? Yeah, exactly. So I sometimes I get worried that newcomers coming into the sport will sort of see some of the drama that goes on and be turned off by it um, because some of it is just really petty mm. and, and mm. dumb. So I, I get a little concerned about that. But, you know, I think as a sport grows and moves forward, um, you know, people that – are against positive changes that are happening in the sport will just kind of get left behind anyway. Yeah. You know, I see we, I see a lot of uh, just from my perspective, uh, like how the sport of jujitsu grew, right? So for me, as as somebody that's that's really been into like kickboxing and boxing and you know this whole rise of MMA, uh, you know, jujitsu for me was incredibly boring to watch until you get further into it and you realize how technical each one of these moves are and like you know, the, the, the chess match and the game and, you know, what they have to strategize to be able to kind of pull these moves off and all this kind of stuff. And I got into that a little bit, just watching Mike in, in how he was able to articulate all these different uh, parts of the movement and like, you know, the placements and like, when you really dive deep into this sport, you realize how extremely technical well not only that but we were talking about uh you know when we first brought this up i thought the same thing too i thought you know god 10 minutes the same move like you know what i I don't know i don't know if i see the sport being that huge because of that but then i think well wait a second that's stupid the the number one watch sport in america is a fucking car going around in a circle. Mm. <laughs> the same fucking circle, the same, like about the same But you speed. could die, so it's got five, that going for you. But in kettlebells, there's definitely a point where you kind of can start seeing either like 
the meltdown uh. or somebody drops the kettlebell. You know, at all, every competition you go to, there's some dramatic, like, the kettlebell flies and almost hits the judge and knocks oh, wow. over the huh. timer. See, this is what we need to You know, so there's yeah. danger. There's danger. Yeah, there's danger. Excellent. So it's just, it's just, like, it's just well, like it's that. It's a war of attrition. I think yeah. people liked it. That's what I was... See the th- body break down. That's what I was yeah. getting to because that's what I came to is that, you know, there's definitely things about sports that are exciting that have to do with the sport itself and then there's the human element and i feel like watching someone do this shit and start to break down and the looks on their faces and then you're like come on you can like hold on keep going like it feels like you would see people like try to go through death and that seems oh yeah exciting to watch there's, there's <laughs> so many epic sets like at the at the worlds that was earlier in february there was so many epic sets and at some at the end of some of them you know people are like screaming as they're like you know pushing out their last few reps and it's like the whole room is just going crazy trying to like cheer and support oh, yeah. them so i think there's definitely some some pretty awesome elements in terms of you know spectating for it and and usually what will what that difference is between, you know, the average person competing and the champion is that you'll see that difference of, you know, the, the average person will, will start to sort of crumble and fall apart. And the champion is the one that's able to keep pushing through to the end, you know, whether or not they're struggling, they're keeping that pace and they're, you know, finishing all the way and putting it all out there on the platform. So they also have counters right above their head. So you get this as a, you know, spectator, I'm watching like, Oh, you know, the last minute you see if a couple people could be within three, within three of each other, I can imagine that getting wild. And it's actually surprising. Like how oftentimes there's a close contest because the, you know, the rep ranges can be so different. Many times there's like, I've been in multiple, multiple contests where it was rep for rep down to the last second you know wow. oh, so it's crazy that gets always exciting as well wow yeah. what, what are some of the craziest things you've seen at some of these competitions well just at the last competition the kettlebell flew and uh the person lifting it fell down so that was kind of dramatic and that that happens at almost any competition it's really? happened to one of the guys i coach you just kettlebells let fly you know so that's always pretty dramatic i don't think i've ever seen anybody like puke well yeah i don't think i've seen them puke i haven't seen them drop like a kettlebell on their head or anything like that but (laughs) you know just kind of probably like they lose their kettlebell over their head and it kind of twists their elbow back and the bell will fall on the ground but um yeah what people you- falling down. Oh, there's there's some guys who will just after they finish their set, they'll just almost like throw their bells and just collapse down on the platform like every time. I like uh, how you said some guys. Oh, oh, it's there's certain guys I'm thinking of. It's like their signature Dramatic. move. One, yeah. one of them being uh, Sergey Rachinsky is a very um, well known lifter and coach from Russia. He has there's a video someone created on YouTube of his like faints at the end of his set so it just goes through one after the other of him to, and some of them it's like it's 32 kilo bells and it's all when he drops them it's like they it's almost like he pushed them up and out and i'm like how how do they how does he have so much energy to push them as he's falling down to the floor it's like really entertaining <laughs> it's like pros it's like the uh, world cup are there involved. are there athletes yeah. or coaches that um you know, you aspire to be like, or you look up to, or that you, I just think are amazing at what they're doing. I know you've name dropped a few people that are really good, but you know, are are there a few that you in particular are interested in or you follow or you like to watch? I would say, um, I, I definitely look up to my, my coach, Dennis Vasiliev. He's like amazing athlete and lifter. Um, probably Abigail Johnston would be the, the female lifter that I look up to. She just, Every single lift she does. Most people in the sport are kind of really good at at one, and maybe they're decent at the others. She is just the top in every single lift, single bell, double bell, doesn't matter. She's um, amazing at all of them, and her technique is just really, really good. So I I love to watch her and and aspire to be like her. What's uh, what would you say your strength is and your weakness is? I would say long cycle is probably my best event. snatch in terms of my numbers not not probably my my worst one although ironically i'm kind of known for being good at it i don't, I don't really know how this works <laughs> i guess i'm like i'm good at it relative to most people but in terms of like high level the other high level athletes i'm i'm nowhere near where they're at yet so that's the one that i kind of need to improve on the most what, what goes through your mind towards the end of a long cycle when you're just dying depends on the day like i've had sets where every minute i'm like 
I really want to set it down. Like, would anyone care if I set it down? It's kind of like that goes maybe over they won't and see over. Me. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe they won't maybe see no me. Maybe no one will notice. <laughs> but um, sometimes it's what motivates me is being close to a previous PR. You know, sometimes what motivates me is the crowd cheering. Um, sometimes it's like just knowing that, like, okay, if I I really don't want to have to do this again. So if I could just get to this number now, then you know I'm good. <laughs> so it really really depends on the day, but. Um, I don't know that at, at the end of most of my sets is a particular thought that goes through my head, but it's just like, I just know I'm, I'm, I'm so close to the end and I've put in so much work already that like, I know no matter what I'm going to finish it. Now, Brett, you brought up, um, you know, you do this now you're in the gym. This is a full-time gig for you. What's that like for somebody? Is there big money in, in kettlebell sport? Can you, can you make a lot of money being an athlete or do you have to kind of be a trainer on the side and do other things? What's that look like? There's definitely not not any money in kettlebell sport at the moment. <laughs> so, if any listeners were looking to you know make it big, that's that's not really the case yet. But um, I I mean I coach at a gym, so we we have a kettlebell sport team. But you know I I teach just regular kettlebell fitness classes, and I I'm trying. I think I'm probably one of the people who's closest to trying to make you know kettlebell sport their career. I, mm. I have kind of built up my online following. I have online students and um, trying to create some different online products. So I think, you know, you can make it work for you um, if you're willing to take that risk. You know, for me, that's something that I I think it's good. I have kind of a niche that I'm working in. Um, and mo- most people at this point kind of have heard of me if they're into kettlebell sports. So um, that's I think it's challenging to try to make it within the kettlebell world, especially because it's not that big. But, you know, one of my my hopes is that I just will help grow the sport. And then as that gets bigger, there will be more opportunities for people to be able to just do their work mm-hmm. within. Kettlebells. You must have a ton of ideas then in terms of what you think needs to happen for it to really grow. Yes. And I'm still sort of discovering it like as I go. I feel like it's it's hard to know exactly what will work, but. Um, I think we're sort of moving in the right direction. Like I said, um, there has for a long time been this idea that we need to follow everything that the Mm. Russian organizations do, but I'm definitely of the mind that I don't think that's the case because I don't think that's what's going to work in the U.S. Why? why, Because of the whole amateur pro type thing? Yes, it's a very different market. And Mm. just because something has been done a certain way for, you know, hundreds of years doesn't mean it's necessarily the right way. And Sacrilege. Seeing, seeing as where kettlebell sport is right now, which is not that big, clearly it hasn't worked that well for, <laughs> for making it into something more popular. So mm. I definitely think that that needs to change. Now, is it because the changes will make it more spectator friendly or because it's more welcoming to people? more More welcoming for sure, because for, you know, for a long time, there's, a, I think there's this whole like mystique about kettlebell sport and people don't really didn't really know enough about it and people were hiding the training secrets around it. So I think that if that knowledge isn't available to people, then how can they even know whether it's something they would like or be interested in? So that's most of what I've done with, with my uh, website and my social media is just try to put the knowledge I have out there and um, share it with everybody for free because it's, it's gonna, it should come out there at some point. Otherwise, how can people even train? They should be at least training the right way. Do you get pushback? Not really. I, I don't, I've had a few small instances of kind of some social media drama, but nothing, uh, nothing really related to people being like mad about anything I'm sharing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of what I learned, I learned from where I first started training the ice chamber and, you know, I had even talked with them about that before I left to go somewhere else. You know, or I asked them, "Are you know, do you guys care if I use what I've learned here to try to, you know, grow something else or do something else with it?" And they're like, "No, you know." I think most good coaches know that if they teach somebody, they're sharing that knowledge for them to continue sharing with other people. I mean, it's not like it's proprietary so who's uh who's uh, your arch nemesis yeah great question <laughs> who's my arch nemesis like, who's yeah. your who are, is there someone who's that you're, targeting you yeah right you're now. super competing against they're or? in the gym and they're like brit <laughs> 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 yeah i mean um that's a good question i'm trying to think of 
who exactly that would be. She's the badass, I mean, bro. Everybody else is I know. Like, everybody else yeah, is you're like, like, I'm, you're like, I'm squashing everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's I'm easy. competitive with everybody. Like, I, I want to beat everybody. So, really, any of the women that are at the high level, like, they probably sort of know that I want to beat them, whether or not I'm, like, ready to, to actually do that. <laughs> I don't know, but... Are, are the Rus- Do the Russians dominate? The Russians, yes. Um, so, in Russia, women are actually only allowed to do snatch. Wait, did you just say allowed? Yes. Oh yeah, I could I could see why it's <laughs> oh, not going to grow Russians. if we don't change some things. Yeah, right <laughs> exactly. there. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. um, they don't really. So women over there don't really compete in any of the other lists except snatch. So yes, they are the Russian women are better at snatch than anybody else. So mm-hmm. you know, there's multiple women over there that have done over 200 reps with a 24 kilo kettlebell in wow. 10 minutes. Did you switch. hear that? <laughs> so my arm just fell off. Yeah. Wow! And a lot of them, two hundred. I think the woman who has the top overall score, she's like fifty-eight kilos, and she like she doesn't look like she lifts weights. Wait, she weighs she's fifty-eight just, kilos, yeah. and she's done twenty-four kilo kettlebell two hundred yeah, like, times. Yep, that's yes. fucking insane. Yeah, I don't know if I could press that. That just shows you like how times. important technique is. Yes, it's all about technique. I mean, because. You, I mean, I couldn't press that over my head 15 times. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> pressing that over a so strict press 15 exactly. times. I, I'd be, well, because you're fighting gravity when you're pressing it, right? right? And when you're using the technique, you're using gravity and momentum to help you. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it makes it that's easier. Im- for that's sure. I don't care, dude. Show us the technique. I don't think we'll be able to. Oh, that. yeah, right. Oh, no, of course not. Well, so, okay. Now, I know a lot of times when I, when I meet athletes, um, are you fully immersed in it? Like this is your, this is like your life you're you're either training for an event you're either training someone else for an event you're, you're eating it. for it you're sleeping you're for hanging it. yeah you're hanging yeah that's me yeah <laughs> <laughs> all kettle all the time yeah. yeah so it can be all the time for sure for you okay so now it, do you ever find that you know you have to kind of disconnect do you do you let yourself do that do you say like okay I'm not. I'm going to just veg out Netflix and chill all day do you do that ever <laughs> like do you have a, like a getaway what do you do if you do that I mean, I, I definitely think... I read kettlebell books. Yeah. <laughs> go go on a vacation somewhere. Like in May, I'm going to Costa Rica, so that'll be like my, my little break from kettlebells. Okay, probably. you're stage yeah. five, right on. Yeah, yeah, my stage <laughs> five. Yeah. I'm going to so, use that term. Uh, how is your, how is your, your nutrition? Uh, how, would, would you classify in partic- any particular way in terms of how you eat, or do you just eat for fuel and then go train? I mostly just eat for fuel, but um, I would say that People know me as sort of like a health nut. Like I don't eat a lot of junk food. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't eat a lot of, you know, hamburgers and fries or donuts or stuff like that. I don't really crave it necessarily. But you know, I did, I did have pizza on Saturday night after my competition. So oh, I, I kind of just, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mostly just eat for fuel. I don't eat um, a ton of meat, but um, I don't classify myself as any kind of like vegetarian mm-hmm. or vegan or anything like do, that. Do you feel better not eating as much meat? Is that why? Yeah, I feel a little bit better not not eating as much meat. I've I've read some different books on you know the the whole factory farming industry, mm. so that's kind of um, been something. I try to stay away from stuff that isn't well sourced. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, if you're uh, all kettlebell all the time, how is that? Uh bode for like relationships and stuff how what's that look like uh, prob- probably not that well <laughs> <laughs> i feel like that's i spend so much all my focus is more towards my career and towards my athletic performance so it definitely kind of takes a little bit of a backseat i would say now have you ever dated another kettlebell athlete have you ever done that uh, I don't. I don't even know if I should answer that. Why not? <laughs> are you not allowed to? Start, that's a yes. Are you not it's allowed to start all kinds of rumors? Oh, uh, answer to this. Well, question. that's what we're. That's what we're here for. Jesus, that's a. We're here to start. Rumors. We're a talk show. You know. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah. Have you have you dated? I would say I've not. I, I have not seriously dated another kettlebell. Is that because they're, you're intimidating? Yeah. You can you whoop on most Flirty everybody, so they're inti- they're intimidated it, by you. What do you think? Maybe I yeah. feel like I have been told that I'm intimidating, so that that could be part of it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, from my side, I don't know if I would be able to date another guy if he wasn't able to lift more than me. <laughs> well, that just narrows it down to yeah. like five people. In the That's world. why it's so hard. <laughs> Sucks. Yeah. Do you? Uh, We're do, all screwed. So you're <laughs> your classic uh, competitive type A, all or nothing mentality. And even as I'm saying this, it kind of makes you excited because you kind of feel like, yeah, fuck yeah, that's who I am. 
do you ever think about like, what do I do after? What am I going to do after this is done? Uh, you know, am I, am I going to be nothing, you know, from all to nothing? I, I think about that a little bit. Uh, try not to think about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I, I co- coaching is a big part of what I do mm. as well. So I feel like um, because of that, I'm not really like afraid of, you know, when the time comes for me to stop lifting, I'm excited to help the sport grow and help, you know, younger athletes come up and, and be better than I was, you know, cause that's what, what coaching is all about. I really love to coach as well. Mm. So, um, I would be fine with that transition. What's your ultimate dream? It's my ultimate dream. I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I definitely would like to have the flexibility in my career to be able to travel or live wherever I want. I would say that having that as part of my lifestyle is a big dream for me. Mm. I haven't quite figured out exactly where I would want to live or if I'd want to, you know, live in multiple places, but that's definitely. What about it. your dream for, I guess, kettlebell sport? Cause you, you you've said several times. Yeah. Where would you, really you like to, see, where would you like to see kettlebell sport in the next three to five years? What, where, where would you like to see the sport? I would just like to see it like exploding in terms of participation competitions. It's definitely grown a lot in the past five years, but I I think the time is ready for it to really start growing a lot. So I would like to see it become, you know, like a big, uh, big big sport, more like CrossFit, that it gets you know national international attention and that people all over like know what it is. That they don't just know what a kettlebell is, but they understand that it's a competition and and kind of what it's all about and i would i would love to be you know a key player in that in terms of like organizing and promoting the sport do you feel like that's happening right now do you feel i mean someone who's been been around it for as long as you have do you feel like there's a different energy going on right now like in the last maybe six months to a year have you noticed that or has it just been kind of a consistent like slow rise i think i think there's definitely been energy growing around it i think also the um the past few years there's been you know women have started lifting double bells more and that's been something that's honestly i think people get the most excited to watch the women lifting the heavy double kettlebells out of anything else in the sport so mm. as that's grown it's built up a lot of excitement um this world championships that i'd mentioned a few times with the club teams that was the first year for it this year so i think that built a lot of energy and excitement um, this competition coming up in May, I feel like, especially for beginners, we've gotten so many new and different people being interested in it that um, I'm really excited to see kind of how that will help also. As Interesting you said that about the, the, the women comp- competing, how people like to watch that. I actually just had this conversation with these gentlemen literally before you walked in and how when you see things really explode in fitness, it's usually the when women get in it and they start doing well in it that it really takes off uh, happened to CrossFit. CrossFit you know, it was a lot of guys, and then girls started getting into it, and then it really started. You don't think that's just off. happened don't, with MMA too? Happened, yeah. I think that's just because uh, sex sells and women are sexy. I, I yeah, don't. We we're like we're to not watch very lift heavy weights. We're not very, it's awesome. We're not very sexy. Yeah. So it's cool to watch women do everything. Speak for yourself, bro. <laughs> no, I think I'll tell you why. I, this is what I think. I think women number one are the consumers. If you look at who consumes, who goes to stores, who buys things, who makes decisions on what to do. Uh, you know, for you know, whether it's buying stuff for your your house, your shampoo, whatever, they have brand loyalty way more than men do. Like, if I ask you guys what kind of shampoo you buy, you could give a shit. Um, uh, they are very, very loyal yeah, to whatever they're know. doing. So when women get into something, they tend to be like, "Man, I'm doing this, and we're all going to do this," and they bring their friends much more than men do. Um, and it's uh, it, it, it just the, the growth the growth potential. Like a guy doing something. The likelihood that they're going to share it all over social media, talk about it, and bring their friends is lower than when women tend to do it. Plus, let's be honest: like uh, there's this like to see women do things that involve strength and athleticism is very empowering, and it's different. It's empowering in a different way to women than it is uh, for men. So when you take a woman who she played some sports and you know maybe not as active now, and then she gets into kettlebell sport and she feels like so empowered by hoisting these you know, these massive, you know, iron, you know, globes above her head or whatever, like that's fucking awesome. It's great. And then it's great to watch too. So that's always, that's my opinion at least. And I would venture to say that the, you've probably seen the growth of kettlebell sport match the the, mm. the growth of the women entering the sport. Am I wrong or? No, I think you're right. And I think a lot of it is uh, um, 
what you just touched upon that last point, it's about breaking barriers, you know, about women breaking these pre-existing barriers, either, you know, if there was an actual barrier, like they weren't allowed to do this, or if it was just um, going past what people thought they could do or, or um, their own personal barriers. I think that's something that, you know, it can be very empowering to experience or to watch for other people. Now, for somebody who's uh, maybe listening right now and they're like, you know, fuck, I want to try this. I want to get into this. Like, where would you recommend someone to start? Like, I, you know, I have never picked up a kettlebell before. Where do I start? <laughs> oh, you son of a bitch. <laughs> where, where do I start? I, I got you right in the kettlebell. I got offended right there. <laughs> well, I would probably recommend them to check out my website or my YouTube channel. I feel like um, I've got I've got a lot of good tutorials and things on there for people that are interested in, oh, in nice. starting and learning the technique um, or taking a look at uh, Kettlebell Kings has a great kind of four-week beginner program that um, Aaron Vivial helped them put together. So um, that would be a great resource for people as well. Excellent. Uh, let's talk a, a little bit about the competition we have coming up here uh, at Mind Pump uh, Media. It's we, we knew it would get some attention. Uh, you know, Mike is putting it together um, uh, mainly very, very well. He knows lots of people, and Mike's a great guy. Um, but we did not we, – we had no idea that it would get this much – attention like it's already getting sold out way before the event i guess mike says that almost never happens and we're getting people from rival organizations and why why are we getting all this attention yeah, big players our, are coming in in our competition is it the prizes is it prize money is it the attention it's getting is it the, because it there's been there's been a need for this i feel like you're searching for a compliment right now well i don't know I feel, <laughs> maybe i feel like could, 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 mind, could mind pump have something to do with it? i feel like well i i if, i <laughs> I don't, Definitely, yeah. you're pr- you're pretty, bro. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, for, like, what 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 do you think's going on? Because for me, when I see this, I'm like, holy shit, there was a need. There was a need in the market for something like this. Like, what 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 is it that's making these people come to compete from different organizations? Yeah, I think there was a need. I think there's enough people involved that, like, I don't think um, me me and Mike, as being the main people that are promoting to the people we already know in the sport, I think we're both fairly neutral in terms of. Not necessarily, you know, only with this organization or only with this one. So we're trying to reach out to, you know, the the different people we know in the sport to to bring them all together. I think that, you know, it's been a you guys have done a great job helping to promote it and um, promote, you know, people getting interested in kettlebell sport. I think Kettlebell Kings has been doing a great job with that as well, with getting, you know, finding those interested parties and kind of directing them in the right direction. And as I mentioned before, there's not really anything with kettlebell sport in this like South Bay area. So I think that there's definitely a need for that. I know there's a lot of people that are excited about it being in this area. Mm. So I think that's definitely played a role. Well, we're very excited to oh, be hosting yeah. it. Yeah, we're super, super pumped, and we're super pumped to see the. We want to do it justice too. Yeah, we want to make sure we have a good time it. doing yeah. it, and um, and that it feels welcoming to everybody. Oh yeah, before we before we hang up on that, to, you know, we got the chance to talk to Mike a lot about the about this, but um, you know, we're really going all out on this event. I mean, we plan to have you know food trucks out here, DJ going. Like, we want to make this really cool. Is there anything that you can think of that you either, one, haven't seen at another event or you saw maybe at one or two you really thought was cool and you liked that um, would be neat to see? Mm, that's a good question. Well, I think um, the the prizes, which we've already kind of addressed that are going to be there, but I think that's something that's, that's really awesome because um, – When you say prizes, what – and we kind of actually talked about this a little bit. Like I was really – headstrong about making sure that we had cool trophies because i feel like when you're an athlete or a competitor like there's something about getting bringing home a trophy like yeah and i'd rather have a trophy than a little than a little medal or i'd rather oh, yeah. or a little I've, certificate that i hand you like i want a fucking trophy so, <laughs> do, you want feel that so trophy. do you feel the same I way i prefer a trophy to a medal okay okay, sure. okay okay good yeah. Yeah. okay good i just want to make sure we're on the same page because right? <laughs> yeah. if yeah, not we, we could save a lot we of money room and get the fucking medals, you know what I'm saying? trophies <laughs> yeah certificates yeah. we could have done at kinko's you know what i'm saying that'd be a lot easier so <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah, I think that's important. You. Yeah, if there's anything else, let us know uh, that we can include in this competition. We want to make sure it's it's awesome. I think, little- I think one of the most helpful things would um, be, you guys, I'm sure you guys are covering this, but getting a lot of great media for, you know, getting a lot of pictures and yeah. videos and stuff that you can use then to promote other competitions going forward uh, would be awesome. Because like you said, there's a, 
a lot of people that might have great information, but they're not presenting in a way with today's social media and everything online. It's like if it's not really good quality and catches people's attention, they're just not going to look at it. Mm. Can so. we jazz up the uniforms a little bit, maybe? What uniform? Jazz them up. <laughs> yeah. Sequins. Make them flashy. No, how does yeah. that work? I, I've noticed at some competitions, everyone kind of has like a similar uniform. Is that like, are those rules? Like you can't wear certain things? Yeah, so, so most of the time... You, you have to wear like spandex or tight fitting shorts above the knee because part of the judging of the competition is that you can see that people um, like lock out their knees at the oh. top. Um, and so, same thing with the arms. You, sh- you have to be able to see their elbows. Mm. So that's that's a requirement. And then besides that, people will often wear, you know, they're, they're just their club T-shirts and things like that. Well, excellent. Mm. Well, all uh, right. We are uh, very happy to have you. Uh, part of, of the here. family yeah part of it part of the family yeah, now really you're part of the family you're official you've been in the cube uh, yeah uh, and we hope to do more more things with you Britt I think you're a good represent, uh, representative uh, and ambassador um, for the sport Thank you've got you. a great attitude and we personally our opinion is that we think that there's a very bright uh, future for the sport um, and we're looking forward to seeing yeah we, we want to support it in any way we can for sure totally so uh, but it's been awesome having you on Thank Thanks you guys so much on. for having me. Thank Thanks. you. Hey, listen, if you like Mind Pump, go to mindpumpmedia.com and sign up for 30 days of coaching for free. Every single day you get an email covering a particular topic that has to do with fitness, wellness, nutrition, strength, fat loss, all those things. Um, and on, on that email will be uh, episodes that we've done where we've covered that particular topic in detail, time stamped. So you could just go right to the period of the, the the point of the podcast that covers that particular topic. Also, you can find us on Instagram at Mind Pump Radio. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal, Adam at Mind Pump Adam, and Justin at Mind Pump Justin. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at MindPumpMedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes Maps Anabolic. MAPS Performance and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.